If you've ever realized that the ACOG is now a relic of history, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Guys, like and comment. If you're in the military, comment with a story about the ACOG. If my Marines tell me about how you broke it. If you're a civilian, reminisce about the fact that this is now becoming history and how odd that is. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest support of the channel right now is Brownells, the hero that we both need and deserve. They are bringing back ancient weapons from the grave to haunt us because they can with the AR-180, the AR-10, and others. They rock. Big supporters of the Second Amendment. Can't thank them enough. Go check them out. We, of course, have the dude bag. If you want a weird, you know, little thing to get for a guy that you don't know what to get him, dude bag's kind of a nice little malligation. Pretty cool stuff for the most part. I uh, like what they have. And, of course, we have Acre Gold and the Sonoran Desert Institute. <laughs> Guys, ladies and gentlemen, my often forgotten, but most certainly not by me, M68 CCOs, welcome to the channel. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, something that's pretty impactful. This is going to be the future of the military. This is the future military optic known as the DVO, the direct view optic. Maybe the name will change, who knows? Otherwise known as the Six Hour Tango 6 it's been around for a while prior to being adopted as the DVO, and uh, this means a lot. Um, for a lot of people, me included, I qualified uh, in the Air Force on an M16A2. Uh, guys now qualified on the M68 or the ACOG, and soon they'll likely qualify on the DVO because whatever the Army does, the Air Force typically follows. So understand that the Army has adopted this. SOCOM has adopted a different model. And there's another model used on squad designated marksman type rifles. Now, when it comes to the Navy, I'm not sure what optic they're going to be picking exactly. Maybe it's already released, but we do know that the Marine Corps has, of course, picked something different because the Marines, well, they just think a little bit different. And that is perhaps what makes them so good at what they do. Say Frosty Marines. So <laughs> before we get into the review, it's important, and in fact, it uh, it's actually required by law that I tell you what my relationship with, is with SIG, especially when I'm about to do a review. So, to be clear, I have done reviews for SIG before, specifically the MCX and the M18. Um, no ammunition was provided from them, no exchange of money or anything like that. They do give me products, and then, then I review that product. That is pretty standard in the industry, not just in the gun industry, but overall, this isn't... Um, Different from anything that I've done before as far as my reviews are concerned, just understand what that relationship is. It is important that everyone disclose that. So with those things being said, let's go ahead and talk about the DVO. So the DVO is a low power variable optic. The low power variable optic is not a new optic in any uh, way, shape, or form. It's been around for quite a while. Many companies have made some really good low power variable optics. And the question is, how does a DVO stack up to those both combat proven and combat tested optics that have come before it, uh, especially like the Vortex and Night Force and others. Now, if you're not familiar with what a low power variable optic is, no problem, let me explain it to you. A low power variable optic is an optic that can go anywhere from one, pa one power magnification, just like a red dot. So if, when you look through a red dot, you simply see the scene as your eye would see it. And that is pretty close to what a low power variable optic sees. It's not quite as good at one power. And it goes all the way from one power, in the case of the DVO, up to six power, which is above what the ACOG did, which was at a fixed four power magnification. So this optic is both more flexible uh, in many ways for different types of PID because you also have more magnification with it. Now there are of course pluses and minuses that come along with that, but overall I think we definitely have a much better optic than what we had with the ACOG with some caveats thrown in there. And I know but people are getting pissed about that right now, so we'll talk about it. But understand that the low power variable optic is a very capable optic system. Low power variable optics have been used for a very long time in various war zones all over the world by various different entities of the military, anywhere from SOCOM to lower, um, they have just been around. Now, it is definitely surprising that SIG came in with a low power variable optic and they got, got it selected because SIG wasn't really known for making low power variable optics. In fact, I think most people assumed that it would be either Vortex with their E series or their Razor series or perhaps Night Force or Leupold with their the Night Force with their ATAC or Leupold with the Mark VI or something like that. Um, we have the Vortex right here and then we have the Leupold Mark VI right here. 
But against everyone's, um, what everyone thought would happen, the six hour got adopted. So how does it compare? Well, it's interesting. Let's talk about the magnification first. So the DVO does anywhere from one to six power. Now there are, of course, uh, optics with higher magnification. Uh, an optic like the Leupold Mark VI, which is a comparable optic, I would say, to the DVO, does one power to six power. We, have, of course, have the Night Force Attacker that does one to eight power. And then we have the Vortex Gen 3, which does one to 10 power. So the question is, why use a one to six power instead of going to something higher? Well, it comes down to a lot of things. Um, the first thing that I'll kind of point out is that you have to understand what the DVO is made for. So the DVO is made to go on an M4A1. So understand that the M4A1 firing M855, which is a type of loading of 5.56 out of a 14 and a half inch barrel. So about this barrel length, this is of course a URGI, which is a SOCOM rifle, but firing from an M4A1, you understand that there's going to be limitations on range. So the one to six actually does make a lot of sense because everything has to be balanced. Specifically, uh, the more magnification you get, the more weight that you're going to get. The more weight that you're going to get, the the more you either have to beef up, you know, your eyepieces to ensure that they can uh, withstand the beatings that you can take from, you know, military service and all that type of stuff. So everything's a, a balance. Uh, there is no free lunch when it comes to low power variable optic, and I think that one to six does make sense because. It definitely leaves room for being able to beef up the optic and make it more combat capable. Um, and as well, it definitely does put the 5.56 to about the range it's capable at. Now, would I want more magnification? Yes, but like I said before, um, with current technology constraints, I think that the 1 to 6 does make sense. Now understand, if I can have the 1 to 10, that's awesome because although the range of the 5.56 is only so much, the extra magnification from an optic like this, which is a 1 to 10, uh, would be great for PID, which stands for positive ID, because there's a lot more to combat than just taking shots. There's a lot of identification of who am I seeing, what kind of weapon do they have, do they have a weapon, is this the correct target? Those are things that are very important, and a low power variable, power variable optic makes that much easier to do. So there's a lot to be said for low power variable optics. So here's some interesting things right here. So the Gen 3, which is a 1 to 10, weighs 21 and a half ounces. The Leupold Mark VI, which is a 1 to 6, weighs about 17 ounces, a very lightweight optic. This DVO, which is also a 1 to 6, weighs around 22 ounces. So it weighs a lot more than both the 1 to 10 and especially more than the Mark VI. So could they have gotten it lighter? Oh yeah, they certainly could have. But what it comes down to is when it comes to the weight, a lot of things were done to the internals to beef them up for military service. I found that interesting because I've known the Vortex is to be extremely tough. Um, other optics that are beefed up were also like the Attacker, but the DVL being a one to six is a very heavy optic. But that being said, from talking to the engineers at SIG, they did a lot a lot of beefing up of various components to ensure that the thing would be able to survive service. Now, Sage Dynamics did a really good review where he does his typical drop test on the SIG and he didn't notice anything happening to it. Um, I don't specifically do the drop test. Um, that's kind of uh, Sage Dynamics thing and he does a great job with that. He has an awesome channel, but rather with mine, it's just the bumps and scrapes from me dropping the rifle or from it falling off, uh, you know, the little cliffs at my range and that type of thing. And it definitely got gouged uh, like any optic would, but I didn't notice any loss of zero or anything like that. And that it comes down to as much the optic as it does the mount. So when we talk about the mount, this is not the mount that comes with the DVO. Um, the mount from the DVO is of course made by SIG. This is a Scalar Works, and it is the mount I use for most of my reviews simply because it is a incredibly sturdy, sturdy mount. Now, talking about the military mount, what's interesting about it is with a low power variable optic, it sits in scope rings, and of course you have to level it. My question was always, how do you get a US Army Joe to level an optic when the guy can barely tie his own boots? Just kidding, I love you guys. But what SIG has done is we have this line right here. And what that does is on the SIG rings, they are split at the middle. So you simply line up that line with the middle and the split. And once you tighten it down, you have a level optic. So I thought that was pretty forward thinking. Um, it's different from what the Marines did. Marines apparently don't trust their guys. And on the Trijicon 1 to 8 that they adopted, the VCOG, it is already in the mount and there's no leveling that needs to be done. That way you don't have to have jarheads, you know, tightening down. Dude, you know those guys would just crank down on those those hex keys and just snap them off. I can just see that happening already. So maybe a little bit smarter when it comes to the Marine Corps. 
I'm interested to see how that will go um, with the military, with guys having to level that, if that will be an armor level thing or, or how that will be handled specifically. But in any case, that is how the military has handled it with the DVO. Another thing to talk about is, of course, the finish. Um, I actually really, so I really didn't want to like the Tango 6T, but I really do like the finish quite a bit. Um, they definitely match the Coyote better with the components that you're typically seeing on newer rifles, such as the URG right here, or the butt sock from B5 or LMT. So they did a really good job. It's a very attractive color. Compare that to the color that you're getting from Vortex. Nothing against you guys, I love your optics, but it's a little bit more kind of pinkish in hue. And I definitely kind of like the way that the Sig Tango looks a little bit more. Now, it should also be noted that the finish is extremely durable and tough. And this was a big question that I had because the ACOG had also had a very, very good finish. And that thing still wore off like crazy because the military is just horrible. Horrible two weapon components, but we'll see how this ends up doing because unfortunately this is a newer optic and it is Just beginning to get fielded, but from everything that I've seen they've been holding up fairly well Kind of going from end to the butt right here um, at the front of our optic right here. It is internally threaded This isn't new many optics have this um, both the vortex and many others and what this allows is for either attaching a sunshade or for a kill flash or something like that um, again they're just doing what's pretty much in industry standard at this point it is a 30 millimeter tube with a 24 millimeter exit objective it is a 30 millimeter tube um, and they did this to kind of save on weight as opposed to a 34 of course um, there are some good things with the 34 but everything is a balance so like the loophole right here is a 34 and has better light transmission but of course to beef it up you'd likely look at more weight so the question is how much weight do you want and how much does the military want to spend the answer to how much they want to spend is not much at all. So right here we have the elevation windage. So I do like them quite a bit, it's 0.2 MROD clicks per click. Um, and there is of course a zero stop right there as well. Um, I do like that they're capped. I think that makes the most sense. Um, I think did, SIG did some good things with that. Um, on the side right here, we do have the illumination dials. So with the illumination dial, all that you're going to do is it locks in place, much like the Vortex. Um, it's a it's a good system. Again, SIG is adopting a lot of the things that other companies have done. Um, nothing wrong with that. That's pretty, pretty much standard. So you pop it out, and you can put it to the brightness setting that you want. And then between each brightness setting is a off setting. So that does make a lot of sense. Now, what comes into play with the brightness is going to be the fact that it is a first focal plane optic. Very odd that the military decided to adopt a first focal plane on a 1-6 to six as opposed to a second focal plane. Um, first focal plane is good for larger magnification levels, but for a 1-6, to six, it's, a little, it's a little odd for sure. So with a first focal plane, when you pull magnification on it, you essentially are zooming in on the reticle along with the scene compared to a second focal plane where the reticle is constant throughout. So, of course, the good thing about a first focal plane is as you zoom in, all of the zeros you made at the high magnification are the same because they just correspond. As opposed with the second focal plane, it's pretty much wherever you, whatever magnification level you zeroed at, that's what you were zeroed at. And if you're not on that magnification level, you're not going to be zeroed. So perhaps they did it for that. But the problem with the first focal plane is for the direct view optic, you know, kind of a shorter range weapon, you can't get the reticle that bright. Um, and so that's just a problem with first focal plane optics. So although it is plenty bright when it comes to being a first focal plane, um, as far as the overall brightness level compared to second focal plane optics like the Vortex or um, even the Tango that is a second focal plane optic that is being used by SOCOM, it's just not quite as good. Now it is bright enough to pick up in, in, bright, in daylight and that type of thing. Um, again, we are in Washington, so probably extremely bright desert is gonna wash that thing up pretty quickly. But it just is odd. I think a second focal plane probably would have made a lot more sense. Um, but I understand that not everybody uses these rifles as shooters. So the first focal plane is perhaps a little bit easier to use. Now, when it comes to changing the magnification level, um, originally these didn't ship with a throw lever. So as far as putting a throw lever on, there is good and bad with it. The good about it is it's very easy to pull from one to six, but the problem with it is that, especially when you have this rifle slung, especially like a right-handed person, like, well, if you shoot right, I am left-handed, but that lays against your gear and it has a tendency to hit that throw lever and then push the magnification level. So when you go to bring your weapon up, even when you think you're gonna be on, one actually end up being on like 1.5 or two, and you kind of have a little bit of loss of ability to see the entire scene. So if you take it off, if you look right here, 
Um, on the inside of where it's at 1x, there are two fiber optic strands right there. That allows you to quickly see what magnification level you're at if you don't have a throw lever on there. So I think that's quite smart. Um, and of course, we go all the way from the nine o'clock to about the three o'clock from one to six. So it is a fairly simple and a fairly standard setup for what you see with other optics as well. I, did th I do think that they did a really good job with the throw switch if you choose to put it on there. And again, it it's all fairly standard. What's cool about it too is how smooth it feels. So on some optics like the Voodoo or some of the old older uh, Vortexes, when you tried to turn that thing, dude, you had to use both hands and just cr really crank on it. But with the SIG, it's a very smooth ring. They did a really good job with it. So I have to commend them on that. And now going back to the diopter adjustment on the optics. So the diopters make sure that it's working for your eye. Um, I did find it odd that there was no locking ring on there to ensure that the diopter couldn't move. Uh, it's fairly stiff, which is good. Um, and they stated that they wanted it to be able to be you know, moved on the fly, but I much prefer a locking adjustment like you have on the Leupold Mark VI or many of the Leupold low variable optics or on say the Night Force Attacker. So, I would have preferred that on a combat type optic. They chose not to for perhaps a variety of reasons, but uh, that is what they did on the SIG uh, DVO. So it is what it is, kind of a knock for me. I wish it would have been locking, to be honest. So let's talk about actually looking through it now. So when it comes to looking through it, um, when it comes to field of view, first off, the field of view is more narrow when compared to both older or newer optics. So compared to like the Leupold Mark six right here, it has a more narrow field of view. So specifically at 100 yards at one power, you're looking at about 105 um, feet across. Um, that That is more narrow than what it should be. And from talking to the engineers, what they stated was that in beefing up the optic and making it more durable, they lost some of that field of view. It is what it is. It's definitely low for a one to six and kind of an optic of this class and caliber. Um, and that's just what it is. And that goes for both at uh, one power and at six power at about 100 yards, you're seeing about 17.7 feet. Still also pretty low compared to other optics, which typically see anywhere from 117 feet um, at one power all the way to a good deal larger than what you see from the SIG at six power. So you definitely have that narrow field of view, which kind of lowers your situational awareness of what's going around on around the target and that type of thing. Uh, I wish it would be would have been a little bit larger but that's what SIG engineers were able to come up with. That's what we have. So the eye relief is pretty good. So when we talk about eye relief, what we're talking about is how far back from the back of the optic can my eye be and still get a good sight picture. So all the way from about back here, all the way to about right here, I'm getting a fairly good sight picture. And they say it's about a little over four inches and I definitely agree with that. It is very forgiving. Now the eye box itself. So speaking of how far off access can I get from the center of that reticle and still see through it is pretty narrow, especially when I compare it to other optics like the Leupold Mark VI is very forgiving on looking through it as well as the Vortex 1 to 10 is fairly forgiving when I'm off axis compared to the SIG DVO. And I've heard some people say that that is a good thing because it ensures that you're getting a good sight picture, but you know, you might not always give a good sight picture looking around a wall or peeking over a bit of cover. So I wish, uh, I, I do wish it would have been a little bit more forgiving when it comes to that. I suppose with what they had to do as far as bulking it up and cutting weight in certain areas made them have to sacrifice that, the eye box. Now, I will say that the eye relief is really good. It's just another complaint that I kind of have against the DVO. So speaking of color and clarity and sharpness and those types of things. So looking through this optic at one power, it is a fairly, um, attractive optic to look through. It looks good um, at one power. And I thought it was actually wider on, as far as the field of view is concerned due to the clarity that I've seen. Now, once you start to pull up on your <clears throat> magnification level and get towards three and over, that towards six, you start to see some problems with the optics. Specifically, you begin to see separation of colors um, and loss of clarity, especially when compared to um, other optics like the Leupold, the a Night Force Attacker, and the Vortex. And that might be a bit of an unfair comparison given that those optics do cost more than what the SIG costs. SIG sits at around 13 to 1400 and Leupold closer to 17 and then Night Force and is of course closer to three grand. But at the same time, being that they're all used to some extent or another in the military sphere. Um, I do find this on the lower end when it comes to that. But again, that is, of course, a question of how much does the military want to spend? So when you compare this to something like the ACOG, which was known for having a 
just insanely clear, clean, accurate depiction. In fact, maybe even hyper-realistic in many ways. It was a little bit disappointing to pull this thing up to six power and see some of those problems, but it's still a usable, it's still a good optic. It's just not going to be my first choice for a low power variable optic when it comes to any type of gun. Now, when it comes to the reticle, I actually do like the reticle quite a bit. So with a first focal plane, it can be very difficult to have a good balance of being able to see the reticle at one power and then have a good reticle all the way at your max magnification level, in this case, six power. But compared to like the Night Force is very busy with its reticle. Um, I think Sig did a really good job of balancing everything. The lines are just thick enough to be able to see fairly well at one power. And then all the way at six power when I'm looking through it, and we'll pop up a photo right here. Um, it looks really good. It's not too busy. It's precisely what I need. In many ways, it reminds me a lot of the Primary Arms ACSS. It's not a Primary Arms ACSS. I kind of wish it was, but we'll kind of talk about it. It has many things that are quite similar to the ACSS reticle. Now, when you're looking through it, we're going to go ahead and pop a picture right now of the reticle so we can talk about it. So when you're looking through it, you're going to see that horseshoe just in the center there. All right. So of course, these measurements are all in MRADs, but on the ends, those little arrows pointing in, we have movers. So for running targets at near point blank range, uh, that's a great indicator. If we go down, step down the reticle, we of course have our BDC. So that's for 300, 400, 500, and those hash marks that go across it are used to measure a chest. So if that chest, approximately 18 inches across, fits in there, they're probably at that range. It's, it's just a simple, quick way of arranging a target, and it works fairly well, because of course, human beings for the most part are about the same size. Um, I found it to be fairly accurate in my shooting that I've done so far. Now, that Christmas tree coming off, those first dots on the outside correspond to wind holds. So the first dots are five mile per hour holds and the outside dots are 10 mile per hour holds. And it is really accurate. I've, I've had very good luck using this um, optic all the way out to about 500 and it's worked fairly well. I do like that reticle quite a bit. I really do think that SIG did a good job through it. Now we're gonna go ahead and turn on the brightness level again, just so you can see it. Um, just not great compared to some of the other um, optics that we have out here and how you know bright their optics are. Now, quick note on brightness as well. Some people were noted that there is a night vision setting on the optic and they were like, oh great, if you're having a tall mount, you can uh, look through with night vision tube. So uh, that really isn't the point. Um, what it was made for was looking through like a PBS 24 or 27 or any type of mounted night vision device that goes in front of the optic. That way you can look through both of them and use a low power variable optic. Typically you're not looking through a low power variable optic with night vision, just as a quick note. So what does it all come down to at the end? This is kind of harder to sum up because this is a newer optic. Essentially the military had some requirements that had to be met, whether it be from first focal plane or the type of reticle they wanted, but the military got what they wanted. Perhaps not the best low power variable optic, but I think a very solid optic overall. Um, some weird design choices like the first focal plane and a couple others, but I think it has an excellent reticle. I think that it is good enough. I think it will serve quite well. It's not going to be my first choice of an optic. And I think if you want to get one that you look through it and you kind of compare it to some of the other optics out there. Now it does seem to be a very tough and a very ruggedized optic. So I can definitely say that for it. Um, the battery life is on par with everything that we've seen from other low power variable optics around hundred ish hours at usable levels. Um, so there's nothing really new about this optic that does anything more amazing than anything else. But it, again, it will serve the military well. Um, certainly not my first choice on low power variable optics, but we have what we have. The military has adopted it and that is going to be the DVO. So as okay as the optic is with a really good shooter, you're still going to crush with it. It is certainly good enough to perform to a very high level. I have no qualms about it. It is a ruggedized optic and it will likely perform very well. But here's the thing. If you don't train, you're still going to suck with it. Make sure that you get training, ladies and gentlemen. Pat McNamara, Travis Haley, Cogworks, Bear Solutions, all great guys willing to train you because you must have a tool that works and these tools definitely work. But if you don't train, your mind is a weapon. Make sure that you train your mind and get better. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. Appreciate you guys. I got nothing else for you. Final thing for you guys, physical fitness. If you are not physically fit, I would highly recommend it, especially if you're young. Um, there are a few times in your life where it's going to be as easy 
depending for most people, as it is to get physically fit at that moment. Um, there's nothing like when you're young being able to see how fit you can get, how strong you can get. That is something that you have, and that's something that you will not always have. You have a small margin of time to where you can just be at a very high level of fitness. And after that, that level of fitness will directly impact um, your quality of life for pretty much the rest of your life. So I'd highly recommend that you get fit and that you stay fit and that you live a healthy lifestyle. That way you can enjoy all the things that you want to enjoy throughout the entirety of your life. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. Appreciate you guys. And a final shout out to my Patreon people. Thank you for making this channel amazing. I've got nothing else for you.